that uh, meeting is going to happen. So enough about that. I'm very pleased to be joined by our special guest today, Paul Watson, uh, who needs very little introduction, obviously, but uh, just for those who who haven't followed his career as closely as perhaps some of us others have. He's a co-founder of Greenpeace in Vancouver and then started the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society as a direct action organization with regards to illegal unreported and unregulated fishing and the general protection of the oceans. And, you know, certainly, I th if you haven't been following Paul and Sea Shepherd, it's been really impressive how um, the organization has been widely um, uh, re more, much more respected and uh, cooperated with by uh, Interpol in terms of illegal fishing notices. The United, the U.S. Navy certainly, um, you know, acknowledges them and in a positive way. And uh, Sea Shepherd has has partnered with governments in Central America and Africa, and Paul could tell us more about that to help them combat illegal fishing. So it's become a very, very legitimate and and worthwhile partner in the fight to preserve our oceans and the fisheries in our oceans. And of course, those of you locally here know that Sea Shepherd and Alexander Morton have been very active in the uh, fight to um, to uh, to get rid of the open pan fish farms up in the Broughton Archipelago with the, the ship, the Bob Barker has been up there. So without uh, further ado, uh, I'll ask Curtis to please uh, have, have Paul join us on the screen as the presenter. There he is. Hi, Paul. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So yeah, just um, ask you to, uh, you know, to tell tell your story as as you want to tell it to us. And uh, I'm sure you've got a million of them. And particularly, and it's something that that I, you know, was mentioning earlier was like just just in the news last week you had you had hmcs calgary uh pictured uh, in the persian gulf and that huge seizure of heroin and you know and we all love our sailors and but i think why isn't our navy out protecting the the the, the ocean's fisheries you know i mean maybe what they're doing in the persian gulf is good maybe it isn't but i mean so clearly they're, they're under international mandates to to do things and so why you know so so that question pops to mind but anyway so over to you please paul well, aside from, uh, you know, the interception of drugs, uh, one of the other great crimes on the planet is the illegal uh, trade in uh, wildlife. And uh, when it comes to uh, fishing, about 40% of uh, the fish taken from the sea has been caught illegally. And I established Sea Shepherd as an anti-poaching uh, organization, which is now a global movement. And right at the moment, we have 12 ships and uh, they're working uh, in cooperation with numerous uh, governments around the world, in Africa, in Latin America, in the Mediterranean. And uh, what we do is intercept illegal uh, operations and, uh, and shut them down. Uh, so Sea Shepherd is not a protest uh, organization. We're uh, an interventionist, an anti-poaching uh, group. And uh, just last month, we uh, boarded and arrested and seized uh, six uh, poaching vessels in the waters of Sierra Leone. Now, what you're having there is a uh, Asian and European fishing fleets are plundering Africa's waters, and uh, that's causing not just a diminishment in, in fish populations, but it's also wrecking uh, havoc with, the, uh, with many African communities and driving more and more people into poverty. I mean, one of the reasons you have pirates in Somalia and an emerging piracy in the Gulf of Guinea is the fact that uh, these are impoverished fishermen who have been driven into through desperation to become pirates because the real pirates have... Uh, have plundered their, their waters. So that's what Sea Shepherd is, is doing uh, right now. And uh, I think quite effectively, so that uh, we're attracting a lot of attention. The United States Navy has actually a course on what we do at the US Naval War uh, College. And uh, we've been approached by more and more governments uh, to get involved. Now, what that means is that we provide the, uh, the ships and the resources and uh, the volunteers, and they provide the authority. And so we we take their enforcement people out to do the actual uh, arrests. And that's what we do within inside the national waters of various nations outside the 200 mile limit. Then we operate uh, under the guidance of the United Nations World Charter for Nature, which allows for 
non-government organizations and individuals to intervene to uphold international uh, conservation law. Now, I know you mentioned that uh, we're becoming more legitimate. I think we've always been legitimate. Uh, when we don't protest, we don't break laws, we uphold laws. Of course, there's a perception that we break laws, but then again, uh, we have a lot of uh, very, very powerful enemies. And uh, one of the most absurd things is that, you know, we are working actually in partnership with Interpol, but I'm actually on the Interpol red notice list because Japan, which is a very powerful nation has put me on that list. Um, now the Interpol red notice is for, was designed to uh, stop uh, serial killers, war criminals, major drug traffickers. And I'm the only person on the history of that list to be put on there for trespassing or conspiracy to trespass. But again, Japan has the power to do that. And why do they do that? Because we interfered against their uh, illegal operations in the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, cost them over $150 million, shut down their operations and saved 6,500 whales in the process. And that made them quite angry. Uh, I was actually on the list uh, by Costa Rica because uh, in 2002, I stopped a shark finning operation in Guatemala at the request of the Guatemalan government. And uh, the Costa Rica, it was a Costa Rican boat and Costa Rica charged me at the time in 2002 with uh, the fishermen complaints that I tried to kill them. So I was actually charged with uh, eight counts of attempted homicide. But we went into court and we were making a film at the time with Rob Stewart called Shark Water. And we showed that footage in court and it showed very clearly that nobody was trying to kill anybody and the charges were dismissed. Uh, a week later, I was charged again, this time with eight counts of uh, of assault. But once again, we went into court, showed the, uh, the film, and uh, once again, the charges were dismissed and I was given clearance to leave Costa Rica and didn't hear anything about it for about 10 years until when I arrived in Germany, I was arrested on uh, an extradition request by Costa Rica. This time they had changed the car, uh, charge to shipwreck endangerment, which nobody really even knew what it was. But uh, two years ago, that uh, charge was dismissed, and it was dismissed because of a change of government in Costa Rica, which really shows you that it was political and not judicial. You can't just dismiss a charge because of a, of, of a change in government unless it was politically motivated. So I'm proud to say that after you know 42 years of operations, we've never been convicted of a felony. We've never been uh, uh, lost any lawsuits against us some, by some very powerful com uh, com uh, companies, but we have achieved a lot in shutting down hundreds and hundreds of illegal um, operations around the world. That's great, thank you, Paul. And yeah, uh, uh, and, and permit me to, to clarify my uh, my remarks. I guess I was I was thinking that in the perception of of people, you know, you had gone from sort of that pirate uh, approach to uh, to uh, you know uh, how people think in terms of when governments recognize you, that makes you more or less legitimate, which isn't necessarily the case. And so, um, yeah, certainly in my eyes and the eyes of, of, of anybody else, you know, who, who looks at what you guys have done, it's been uh, very legitimate from, from day one. So, um, so is, is there anything, Paul, that, that you see that we as Canadians can do to lobby our government to help in this fight? Well, the problem with Canada is that the Canadian Department of Fisheries and Oceans, in my opinion, is one of the most corrupt, uh, incompetent bodies in the Canadian government. And because of that, we've seen the collapse of the cod uh, fishery on the in the Atlantic, and uh, we're seeing the destruction of indigenous salmon populations on the Pacific coast. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, the government doesn't listen to scientists; it listens to um, the industry. Uh, the, one of the things under the previous government, before uh, the Trudeau government, is that they destroyed all the uh, records for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, just destroyed the files. All that research was destroyed um, to try and cover up I guess, all, the, all of the blunders that they've been making over the years. But uh, slowly, I think things are coming around. Uh, around. It, we've been many, many years opposing uh, the destruction, which is caused by the fish farms uh, in British Columbia. The fact that there's uh, our main concern is the xenomic transmission of viruses from an invasive species, the Atlantic salmon, which has no right to be in Pacific waters. And that those viruses are being transmitted to indigenous uh, species. And uh, that's causing diminishment in wild salmon populations. In addition to the viruses, of course, there's the transmission of, of parasitic sea lice and the uh, pollution of the waters through antibiotics, uh, other chemicals for delicing the fish. And uh, of course, there's the fecal pollution that's uh, involved with this too. It's a highly destructive industry. And 
you know, certainly isn't an alternative because you have to catch about 70 fish out of the wild just to raise one fish on a, on a salmon farm. And, but uh, slowly making progress. I think Dr. Uh, you know, Alexander Morton has done an incredible job and as has the First Nations uh, uh, in British Columbia in, uh, in opposing the, uh, the salmon farms. I think a lot of progress is being made. Right, although uh, that, you know, certainly there are job losses involved with, with a transition like that, which has been difficult for, 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 for some of the, the folks up there. I mean, this is the same, same with the stopping of old growth, which I know isn't our topic here today, but it's like, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to, to stop um, this practice, but then you need a proper transition strategy. So um, could I ask, so what do you think, I mean, obviously DFO is, is our key resource, certainly within the 200 mile limit, to um, to properly manage our, our fisheries and you know I mean so so with the corruption I mean is that I mean are you talking uh, just sort of industry pressure or actual just like is it lobbying or does it go would you say it goes right down to the to the to the officers on the front lines and the scientists or is it more at the ministerial or, or deputy minister level or to, to the extent you can comment on that I don't know. Well, like, like, I guess, I guess, I guess, what, 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 what do we do to change that? Well, DFO scientists can't really say too much, or else they lose their jobs, as uh, we've yeah. seen in the, in the past. As for who's calling the shots, I'd probably look to Jimmy Patterson as the person calling the shots, not DFO. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of corruption, I believe. And uh, you know, why is Alaska have such a, a healthy salmon fish? fishing operation, probably the only sustainable fishery in the world is really? Alaskan wild salmon. Wow. And that's because they don't have fish farms and uh, they're very strict on their enforcement of, uh, you know, for fish and wildlife up there. And I've seen that uh, enforcement. So, you know, I've been, I'm, I've been quite impressed with what Alaska has done. And I think that British Columbia should do the same. Well, yeah, and often we, uh, we, tend to have this superior notion as Canadians that uh, that we do that kind of thing better but that's uh, you know you got to be accurate about that so and then and then the and, I, and I've just put a notice to everybody um, who want to ask questions to you there's the um, it's actually uh, oh, I guess uh, sorry you just need to put them in the chat we don't seem to have that Q&A function here today so I've just asked, so people, if they want to put their questions in the chat, they can. So do you, so Peter is asking, do you think there's any substantial fishing? I'm not sure what that means. Uh, maybe cl clarify your question, please, Peter. Um, what do you mean by substantial? So it's an invitation to meet in Germany. Now, is there perhaps just while people are posing their questions, what are your travel restrictions? Are you able actually able to come to Canada? I've heard that perhaps you're not, or, or does or does that that Japan red notice pr prohibit you from leaving the U.S.? I can, I can leave the U.S. I can go to Europe. I can't go to Canada because Canada will extradite me with Japan. <laughs> They've made that, that quite clear. So ridiculous. But uh, you know, I, I can go to Europe. I can return to the U.S. Uh, so um, only those countries that have a grudge against me are the ones that are going to enforce the extradition request by the Japanese and Canada is one of them. That is so ridiculous. <laughs> Anyways, so um, it, it, uh, is, is that something, again, we, is, I, I'm trying to think, you know, what, what, what does Canadians, can, can we do, if anything, to, to but I, I guess the bottom line is it would it, it have to be up to Japan to, um, to drop the notice. I mean, Canada is just going to respect the notice just probably but japan's not going to do that i mean they they don't want me in japan i mean they haven't actually filed any requests for my extradition where i when i was in france or when i'm in right. the u.s they right. just want to restrict my travel so it's really being done for harassment uh, but um so there's certain countries of course that is riskier and uh but that hasn't you know i think what japan thought was that by stopping me they could shut down sea shepherd and right. uh, what they've uh, discovered is that Sea Shepherd's not me. Uh, you can stop an individual, you can shut down an organization, but you cannot stop a movement. And Sea Shepherd is a global movement. We're in 42 different countries, and uh, they're all separate entities, all working together. And uh, we're, we're being very effective in what we're doing. Okay. So the, the question then is uh, for Peter, do you think there really is sustainable fishing uh, around the world? You mentioned Alaska. Are there other fisheries that you think are good models? I mean, I obviously, some some catch is okay. So it's just a question of you know, 
What's if you're looking at artisanal fishing, indigenous fishing around the world, yes, that's sustainable. But the problem is heavy gear, industrialized corporate fishing operations, hundred million dollar trawlers, 100 mile long long lines, 100 mile long gill nets, um, giant purse saners, super trawlers. This is what is destroying our ocean. And not only is it destroying um, the fish populations, but it's also destroying indigenous and artisanal fishing communities uh, right. in Africa, in India, uh, throughout South America. Uh, these communities are being devastated by the greed and the excess of the industrialized corporate fishing operations. There is no sustainable industrialized fishing. How can you catch a fish like the Antarctic toothfish? And they market it as Chilean sea bass, but it's in danger, but it's being caught and it's being sold around the world. How can you justify that fish pulled out from two kilometers down in Antarctica and Antarctic waters and then shipped to New York and London and Paris and sold for a high price in those restaurants? Right. This is not sustainable fishing. Right. Uh, and it's robbing people around the world of, uh, you know, there are probably a billion people who are absolutely, totally dependent upon fish for their survival. But those are the people who are being, um, their, their livelihood is being diminished. And we, you know what the fishing industry would like you to think is that when you get your fish in the restaurant or at fish and chips or whatever, they would like to think that you to envision a small boat going out there with a small dedicated hard working crew and pulling in the little nets and the lines and, and, and getting the fish to market. That's what they would like you to think. But the super trawler nets can carry probably three busloads of fish in one haul. They grind the bottom of the and destroy the superstructure that on the bottom of the sea. They 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 are extremely destructive. It's like the clear cutting of life in the ocean is what it is. And uh, this has got to be shut down. There shouldn't be a herring fishery. Herring is the uh, the food fish for all the other species. Oh, I know. You need to leave it alone. And uh, certainly not go in with those giant nets and haul everything out in a couple of days. It's like what they're doing. You know, the, the, we, we predicted in the 1980s that the, uh, the northern cod fishery would collapse. And of course, nobody listened to us. And the Canadian Department of Fisheries Ocean said, you know, we have the best scientists in the world. We know what we're doing. There is no way that this is going to collapse. And in 1992, it collapsed. And uh, of course, they had nothing to say after that. But I remember I was doing a, a debate with a fishery scientist uh, for the DFO. And I said, you know, in, in three years, uh, you know, the, 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 this uh, salmon run here is going to collapse. And he says, Watson, you don't know what you're talking about. We got the best scientists in the world. We have the computer models. You, you are wrong, sir. And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, I was wrong. Six months later, it collapsed. Wow. So, you know, and these people, I got a name for these scientists who work for governments and corporations. I call them biostitutes. They say whatever they need to say, and they get paid to say it. Wow. And, and, and the, the uh, uh, Atlantic cod hasn't recovered, despite the moratorium. They're not going, they're not going to recover in our lifetime. No. Okay. You know, I said in, in, in 2015 at the uh, COP21 conference in Paris, we had to get, I had to fight to get a, a forum on oceans. You know, we're talking about climate change and the greatest regulator of climate is the ocean. And we finally got it there and it got taken over by the fishing industry. And I had to listen to speeches about how climate change was gonna affect the, pro the movement of the product through the water, blah, blah, and everything like that. But uh, I said, look, you know, there's only one solution here, at least a 50 year moratorium on industrialized corporate, corporate fishing operations. Right. We can learn something from the Polynesians, you know, for hundreds and hundreds of years, they had this thing called kapu, uh, say uh, Hanama Bay in Hawaii or a Bay in Bora Bora would be declared kapu, which means that no fishing for 20 years. Anybody caught fishing in that bay, it was a death penalty. Wow. And people might think, well, that's a little extreme, but not from their point of view. From their point of view, they knew that if the fish disappeared, they would too. They, could, they wouldn't survive. There is no kapu areas anywhere in the world today. The fish have no place to run. Rayathon, the fish finding company, they have an instrument, the fish finding instrument. And the model for that instrument is the fish can run, but they can't hide. Mm, That's the problem. There's no place for the fish to recover from the demands that we're making upon them. Okay, so uh, a couple other questions here. Can you, you, you mentioned 70 wild salmon to one farmed. Can you just uh, uh, explain that a little more, what that means? Well, massive fisheries of anchovies, sardines uh, that are taken off of Peru and various places, uh, which are rendered into fish meal. About 30% of all of the fish caught in the world is rendered into fish meal. 
It doesn't go just to domestic salmon. It also goes to chickens and it goes to pigs and fur bearing animals. Oh, okay. and, um, and, and so this is where it's put into cheap meals for animals, really. Okay. And, that. and a good percentage of that goes to, uh, goes to uh, the fish farms. We also catch 2.8 million tons of fish, which goes just to cat food every year. So what we have is a situation where chickens on factory farms are eating more fish than all the puppins and albatrosses together. We have a situation where cats are eating more fish than all the uh, seals in the, uh, in the North uh, West Atlantic Ocean. So it's, it's, a, it's a world out of balance completely. And uh, these, these uh, fish meal plants are causing enormous problems, economic, social problems in places like Africa, for example, where uh, you know, it's driving the local fishermen out of their communities as they, they, they go out there and they harvest these great amounts of fish and render it just into, into fish meal. Right, okay. Uh, here's some, a comment about uh, the movie Sea Spiracy. Have you noticed an increase uh, in public support or change in public support since that, the release of uh, that? Seaspiracy has been yeah. enormously um, um, helpful for, for what we're doing. And not only are we getting more uh, public support, but we're getting more interest from various governments and in inviting us to get involved. So right now we're, we're working in cooperation with about a dozen African countries. Uh, and in Latin America, we're working with Panama, uh, Peru, and uh, Ecuador and Mexico and uh, Colombia. And uh, so we're getting more and more invitations there. In the Mediterranean, we're working oh, with wonderful. the uh, police in Sicily, for example, to intercept and confiscate fish aggregating devices which have been set illegally. So uh, the film has got, attracted a lot of uh, attention to what we're doing on uh, two governments around the world. Okay. Uh, so there's a question about the current status of whale populations and what are the threats to their survival beyond the Japanese fleet measuring their uh, stomach contents, <laughs> according well, to them. I'm happy to, say, I'm happy to say that since we began this 1975 uh, fighting the whalers, whaling has been uh, pretty much 95% reduced on the planet. There is no pelagic whaling anywhere in the world today. Uh, the Japanese are no longer killing whales in the Southern Ocean uh, whale sanctuary. When we began in 1975, we were going against countries like Australia and Chile and South Africa and Spain. All these were whaling nations, um, Brazil, Peru, and now Australia, for example, is one of the leading defenders of whales. So things have changed. I'd say that about 95% of whaling operations have been shut down. And the whaling that remains today is restricted to the territorial waters of Japan and Norway, uh, the Danish Faroe Islands and uh, Iceland. But Iceland hasn't killed any whales for the last three years and we're watching them quite closely. So I'm quite convinced that whaling will be eliminated uh, soon. I, I, that, that my lifetime goal is to see the total eradication of whaling. Uh, and I, I think that's something that's going to be achieved. It makes no economic sense whatsoever. And we're starting to understand the value of whales in the ocean. They are the farmers of the ocean. They keep the phytoplankton populations healthy. And since, and according to Scientific America, uh, phytoplankton populations have uh, been diminished by 40% since 1950. Now, what does that mean? Phytoplankton provides 70% of the oxygen in the air that we breathe. If phytoplankton disappears from the ocean, we die. We don't live on this planet without phytoplankton. And phytoplankton is kept healthy by seabirds and marine mammals. One blue whale every day defecates three tons uh, into the sea, very rich in nitrogen and iron, the primary nutrients required by phytoplankton. So when you diminish whale populations, you diminish phytoplankton populations. We have to look at these species in the sea as being part of a system which supports all life on this planet. One of the things I like to, to, to equate this to is look at the earth as a spaceship, which is what it is. We're on this incredible voyage around the Milky Way galaxy and every spaceship has a life support system. And that life support system provides us with the air we breathe, the food we eat and also regulates climate and temperature. And that life support system on spaceship Earth is run by a crew, a crew of Earthlings or citizens of the ocean that maintain all of that. Humans, well, we're, we're, we're uh, passengers. We're having a wonderful time entertaining ourselves. But what we are doing, we're murdering crew members. 
And there's only so many crew members you can kill before the machinery begins to break down and the life support system is no longer capable of supporting uh, life, including our own. So we have to understand that all of these species there are working in harmony with each other. The three basic laws of ecology, the law of diversity, that an ecosystem is dependent upon diversity within it. The law of interdependence, that all of the species within an ecosystem are interdependent with each other. And the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth and a limit to carrying capacity. And when we diminish, uh, and when we steal the carrying capacity from other species, we cause diminishment in both diversity and interdependence. And that does not bode well for the future. All right. Um there's a comment here about pinnipeds, and I can imagine that uh, your uh, thinking is that uh, Jimmy Pattison is more um, <clears throat> a problem to, uh, you know, through, through his herring fishery that, to the salmon than uh, sea lions and uh, seals. And that, so, that, that the destruction of pinnipeds to uh, protect salmon is not a good idea. Well, seals, sea lions, like dolphins, whales, they're always been scapegoats for the greed and the excess of the fishing industry. Yeah. There isn't an overpopulation of seals or sea lions. You know, <laughs> the population of seals in the North Atlantic Ocean, for example, has been reduced to less than 10% of its original numbers 600 years ago. And there was no shortage of fish in the 1500s when Jacques Cartier first landed in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. He would describe that. And, you know, the, the codfish used to be about two meters in length. Now they're down to about 18 inches. The, it wasn't the seals that killed off the cod. It was a fisherman. And it's the same on the West Coast, too. You need a healthy population of marine mammals if you want a healthy population of fish. Nature has managed this very well for millions of years without our interventions. What happens is that seals maintain the balance. They go after species which are a direct threat to other species, keeping those in balance. They also provide a nutrient base uh, to phytoplankton, which in, in turn provides food for zooplankton, which in turn provides food for fish. So rather than get, having less seals, we actually need more seals and more sea okay. lions. Uh, you know, the richer and more diverse an ecosystem is, the stronger it is. Okay. Any thoughts about kelp farming? You know, I have a real problem with with uh, taking anything out from the ocean in large amounts. Uh, if it's if it's restricted to uh, you know a manageable bit and 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 properly properly uh, caretaked, I think that we can that that that's something that can be done. But you have to understand that seagrasses and kelp and everything also are um, a foundation for the li the life of many many species in the sea and everything is interdependent. You'll find that there's literally hundreds of species that are working in harmony with each other within these ecosystems. And when you start removing one of them, you're going to affect others. And uh, that's right across the entire spectrum, both on land and, uh, and in the ocean. Right, sorry, I think I mischaracterized the question. I think, I think the questioner was talking about um, introducing more kelp. Um, oh, well, absolutely. All yeah. for that, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we sure. Have, we have a program. We have a program in the United K Kingdom of, uh, of cultivating and uh, reintroducing seagrasses. And we've also been doing coral propagation in the uh, South Pacific Islands. Okay. Uh, I think we're... I've got it's the tiniest little scroll bar here that I'm trying to go through these uh, questions here. So bear with me. I don't want to lose one. I think we're somebody's talking the question about fire retardants and, and PCBs on beaches. Um, many many of the coastal fire departments have training practices that use uh, fire retardants, which with PCBs in them, and they use them on the beach as a concern. And this is. It's more of a, of a legislative, you know, a, a, a domestic legislation. So, oh, somebody's talking about the book behind you as it relates to the Salish Sea. Oh, Orcopedia, is that the book that they're referring to? Yeah, I'm, I'm guessing so. Yeah, that's a book I did last year uh, along with Tip Tiffany Humphrey. And it's really, it's um, looking at all the orchids that have been captured from the wild, uh, what happened to them. Over 250 of them have died in captivity. And it also documents the ones that are in captivity, where they're being kept, how they're being treated. Um, it's really um, a global uh, slave trade is what it is. We're wow. capturing these animals just for the amusement of people and ab uh, severely abusing them in, in the process. It's, a, it's an industry which shouldn't exist. 
Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, just uh, bring you back to sort of the earlier discussion. So I guess, so we talked about, um, about, you know, so, so DFO has, has jurisdiction up to the 200 mile limit. Uh, beyond that, what, what authority would this, it would be the United Nations. So, because, so for example, the, the Canadian uh, presence in the Persian Gulf, I, I believe is under United Nations mandate. So, so the United Nations can, I understand, issue a mandate for naval action on the high seas. I, I believe I'm correct. And, and if that's the case, that, and, and, and you mentioned that the convention that the UN had, I um, can't remember what, what the name of it was, but do you feel that the enforcement provisions of that need to be beefed up? Because I mean, you're, you're doing work with national governments in the coastal waters, but so, so I guess the, the question is what needs to be accomplished, I, I assume at the UN in order for uh, there to be, you know, naval assistance uh, in enforcing on the high seas against poaching? Well, there is no enforcement uh, out beyond 200 mile limits uh, anywhere. And it's not just about illegal fishing. It's also the fact of uh, stopping slavery at sea. A lot of these uh, fishing vessels, especially in Southeast Asia and in African waters, uh, uh, the people serving on board are not doing so willingly. Uh, it, it even comes into the U.S., for instance, uh, American fishing boats coming into Honolulu, for example, the crews on board aren't allowed ashore because they're not U.S. citizens. Now, they're not slave labor, but they only get $300 a month to work on American fishing boats. And, of course, uh, those boats are making a very large profit, so it certainly is uh, exploitation. But uh, they're really, uh, the United Nations really isn't doing anything about enforcement, uh, unfortunately. And when you look at the ocean, it's really the Wild West out there. Yes, they're concerned about uh, piracy. Yes, they're concerned about um, drugs, and they'll intervene there. But there really hasn't been any, any initiative to intervene against illegal fishing. Although the U.S. government is looking at this uh, and seeing that there is a need for, the, for something like that to, to take place. But as usual, the government's things take a long time to, to really, sure. uh, really develop. But, but conceivably, the U.N., you know, has the mandate to do something about it if they so wanted to. Well, they do. But, you know, we've been talking about the law of the sea now for three decades, four decades, yeah. and uh, yeah. nothing's really been resolved. Okay. Uh, we're pretty good on time here. Um, another question here is on what do you think about the move to uh, land, fish farms on land? Well, I think that's certainly an improvement. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to eliminate the problem about um, polluting the, the waters. Uh, you still have the problem, of course, of, uh, of what they feed the fish and the chemicals that are being used uh, in, the, in the process. Uh, but it is an improvement. Uh, we are opposed to it, but uh, we're, we, we will admit that there's, it's going to certainly benefit the marine ecosystems uh, if, that, uh, if they move it onto land. Okay. I guess, uh, I think I've captured most of them here. The discussion about cruise ships and the dumping of gray water and black water, I think that's uh, obviously something that uh, would be a good idea to, to uh, stop. Well, pollution is a major problem. It's not just uh, fecal materials, it's chemicals, it's radiation, it's, it's noise pollution from a lot of these ships too. Um, the pollution is, and plastic pollution is, of course, a major problem, especially with the breakdown into microplastics. Uh, sea Shepherd is very much involved in removing marine uh, debris from remote places. Like, for instance, we took 40 tons of uh, fishing gear, plastic fishing gear from Cocos Island off Costa Rica, removed that. We took uh, thousands of uh, tons of uh, material off of a Cocos Keeling Island uh, in the Indian Ocean. We cleaned up beaches in Northern Australia and our chapters have beach cleaning operations all around the world, including Canada. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Well, here's a question wondering how much illegal fishing occurs within the 200 miles of US and Canada. Well, I think, that, of course, it does take place. It's not as bad as many other countries. Uh, one of the problems that we have around the world is that marine sanctuaries, uh, reserves, um, these are the places where the poachers go. For instance, the Galapagos uh, National Park Marine Reserve, about 300,000 sharks a year are taken out of that marine reserve. So it's very difficult to enforce these vast areas. 
And when you, uh, you know, I, I'm absolutely certain that there's poaching operations in, uh, in Canadian waters and, you know, PFO or Coast Guard actually catches some of them, but uh, it's, it's hard to really monitor that, that much um, territory. But, no. uh, and, then, and a lot of it goes on the fringe, you know, you sneak in, sneak out, that kind of thing. Right, right. Okay, well, uh, any thoughts then about, you know, how people can help out Sea Shepherd and, uh, and move things forward on that front? I know you've got the chapter in Victoria and Vancouver. Well, Sea Shepherd remains uh, primarily a volunteer movement. And uh, right now we have about 250 volunteers from 25 different countries on those 12 ships out there. And so we're always looking for people who want to volunteer to be on the ships or be shore volunteers, supporters. And of course, people can support us financially. We're rather small, uh, you know, because we don't invest money and we don't do fundraising. We don't invest money into advertising, that kind of thing. You'll never get a direct mail piece from us, you know, asking for money uh, because we feel that people should recognize the problem and people will come to us if they feel that we can provide, uh, we can provide a solution, which we, we try to do. But we're really, uh, we're a global movement of volunteers is what we are. And we certainly welcome people to, to get involved uh, on all those different levels. Okay, thank you. Well, we'll circulate the link in a, in a follow-up email. Um, and for those who want to go on the ships, uh, the training provided, or do you suggest people take like a maritime safety course? First, it always, or? Helps, it always helps if people know more things. Yeah. But we, of course, we do train, uh, we yeah. train people as they come on board. We're really looking for passionate people. And, yep. uh, you know, one of the things that I used to get criticized for is uh, they said that uh, I, I would ask crew, are you willing to risk your life to uh, protect a whale? And they said, how can you ask people to risk their life to protect a whale? I said, well, we ask people to risk their lives all the time to protect real estate and property, religion, flags. It's a far more noble thing, I think, to protect an endangered species or a threatened habitat. So I don't see anything wrong with that. And there certainly is no uh, lack of volunteers who, uh, who agree with that. Well, it's so impressive watching, you know, your crews in action and, and, and they're so young, so many of them and the captains, you know, they, and, and they have such uh, sang fraud and, and uh, common sense. They're just, you know, in, in these very dicey situations and uh, just, and, and, and having to make these decisions, you know, I mean, you're, you're not armed, you don't have an armed vessel. You've got to, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, it's really fascinating to watch. Yeah. I think we, we've got a couple more questions here, but uh, Anyway, sorry, you were going to say, Paul? Yeah. Oh, I was just saying that our most powerful weapon is the camera. We document everything. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we that's we produce quite a few documentaries in addition to the TV shows that we've done, yeah. uh, which is our educational branch. <laughs> yes. Okay. I think one last question here, Paul, and we'll, we'll let you go. Um, depleted uranium left by naval exercises off our Pacific Northwest coasts. What to do? What, what to do about that and what yeah. should be recovered. Uh, I mean, it's a major problem of, you know, off in North America, in Europe, all over, everywhere. It's a major problem. You know, containers of nuclear uh, waste, uh, containers of chemicals. There's like a big dump right off of Santa Catalina Island off of Los Angeles that we've been trying to uh, point attention to for a long time. Uh, I, you know, back many years ago, that was common practice. I remember I, when I was in the Canadian Coast Guard, we used to go out and, um, you know, change the batteries in the lighthouses on Vancouver Island. And uh, we were told to just throw the batteries over the cliff. Well, you know, that was just common. That's what we did. Every, uh, you know, when you protested, you get fired. So we didn't say too much about it at the time, but, uh, th but that's what we did with our waste. We dumped it at sea. It was our, that was uh, the collective uh, toilet for the, for the, for all the nations, not just Canada. And I, I'm not sure re really uh, what, what, it, what were the situations in Victoria, but, uh, is Victoria still putting raw sewage into the ocean? Uh, I know for a long time that was a major problem. No, we, 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 we've undergone a, a big treatment process, uh, which, which was politically charged, but no, it, uh, it is being treated now, um, whether it's to the, to the level of, uh, you know, where it absolutely should be, but it certainly is receiving treatment now. Um, so, yeah, no, it's, uh, no, we, 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 we've moved on that. Um, so I'm just respectful of your time here. Other people in the chat, just, you know, is any, any thoughts that you just want to continue to share with us if, if you still have a little more time? Oh, I'm fine on time. Okay. People say you're their idol. I'm sure that's a nice view to hear. Um, so yeah, any, any further uh, discussion topics you'd like to raise with us? 
Well, I think that what, you know, we're going to have to adapt a new way of uh, looking at where we are in relationship to the planet as a whole. Um, you know, for too long, we've taken this anthropocentric point of view that it's all about us. It's, we're the only thing that matters. You know, I got a call from uh, Brett Hume, a reporter for Fox News uh, a few years ago, and he said, I heard that you said that bees, trees, worms, and fish were more important than people. And I said, yeah, I said that. He said, how can you say something so outrageous? And I said, well, I said it because it's true. They're more important than we are for the simple reason they can live here without us, but we can't live here without them. A world right. without trees, a world without bees, a world without fish. That's not a world that's going to support us, but you know what? If we disappeared, everybody, all those other species will do just fine. So ecologically, are far more important than we are, and we should really recognize that and learn to live in harmony uh, and be interdependent with all of those other species. Well, I love, I love your spaceship uh, uh, analogy with, you know, with the crew members being all the creatures on Earth and, uh, and yeah, really, what do, what do humans contribute positively to the to the ecology? I, nothing pops into my mind apart from us being well. I think we should also, takers. we also need a new understanding of what the planet is. Um, I call it the planet ocean because that is what it right. is. Right. Um, but really, what this planet is is water in continuous circulation. Sometimes it's in the sea, and sometimes it's in the clouds, and sometimes underground, sometimes in ice, and it's sometimes in the in the cells of every plant and animal on the planet, constantly moving through all of those different mediums. So the water in your body right now was once in the sea, once in ice, once underground, once in the clouds. And it was once in other in the bodies of other plants and animals, constantly circulating, we, meaning we're all interconnected with that one common element, water. This is a water planet. And what affects one part of that ecosystem affects all other parts of the ecosystem. What we put into our bodies ends up in the sea or it ends up in the air. Um, you know, for instance, just every year with crematoriums in Canada alone spew 17 tons of mercury gas into the ocean, into the, into the atmosphere, which ends up into the sea and everything else. There's so much interconnection that we're not even aware of, and we should be, we should be aware of that. No kidding. Oh, you know, something that's occurred to me, it happened what, what, 10 years ago, there was that ocean filing dump off of Haida Gwaii. Oh, yeah. By your response, I'm guessing you weren't a fan of that. No, we shut it down in the Galapagos. They first went to the same company, went to Galapagos, and uh, oh, okay. we were able to stop them from doing that. Uh, you know, you don't, if you want to protect the phytoplankton, protect the ecosystem, you don't drop uh, iron filings in there. Yes, it might uh, spur a, a, a growth in a, in a short period of time, but it certainly isn't going to be something that uh, is going to be um, ongoing. And right. It's really, you're dumping, you're dumping garbage. It, 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 they failed to get um, an environmental assessment through the uh, EPA in the United States. Uh, they had no scientific backing for what they were doing at all. Right. Um, well, there's a few more questions here, if you're okay on time. Do you plan to convert convert away from diesel on your ships? Well, yeah, it'd be nice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we have one sailing boat, but here's the problem. We can't catch poachers with sailboats. Right. But we are actually making a contribution in a strange way. Uh, we shut down literally hundreds of illegal fishing vessels. And every one we shut down is one last vessel that's burning diesel fuel. So we actually cause less diesel fuel to be consumed than what we consume ourselves. Which but uh, in the future, yeah. yes, it would be nice if we could find an alternative to that. But uh, right now yeah. our job is catching poachers and uh, yeah. and we have to have the vessels that, uh, that, are, that can do that. Yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, so sort of our, our takeaway here, again, as Canadians who are involved in the political process, obviously, uh, we mainly want to focus on on having a DFO where scientists are really actually listened to and aren't afraid to speak and enforcement that goes from that um, and and then to reduce the uh, the impact and influence of the big corporate fisheries um, the UN clearly we would like to be more um, involved in in international enforcement. And um, so so people are asking sort of what levels of government, I mean, it, it's, you know, different level of, gov of governments are more, 
prone to listen to their populations, but the reality is you've got to figure out who's got the jurisdiction that you want to influence. And so for us within the 200 mile limit, it's, uh, and with fish farming, it's the DFO, it's the feds, and then the UN on the high seas beyond that. Um, so yeah, the, the, the certainly one thing we'd like to focus on. And um, how do you see, so with the transition here, from open fish farms to the uh, the land-based ones, are you are you generally happy with how that? I mean, obviously, it's taken longer than it should have, but with the direction that we're going there. Well, I think the trend is good, and I think that the uh, First Nations and Alex Morton have their work is is really contributing towards uh, you know uh, securing that uh, that possibility, and uh, hopefully sooner rather than than later. I mean, ultimately, the the solutions uh, are political, and uh, but as long as we have governments which are controlled by vested interests, then uh, we're going to have uh, problems. I believe there will be a green government uh, someday, but it'll probably take a lot of diminishment before uh, people recognize that that's the way we're going to have to go, and uh, there won't be any other all alternative. And uh, hopefully sooner again rather than later. But, uh, you know, green politics uh, is a growing political force uh, throughout the world, and it will become more so. Well, certainly in 2015, Trudeau promised, he said, this would be the last first past the post election. And, uh, you know, so g g green voters said, well, that's great. We can actually vote our conscience instead of uh, strategically voting to prevent Stephen Harper from getting in. And so, and so, so we've, we've suffered under this first past the post and strategic voting system. Uh, but it, it's, it's just shocking to, to me and anybody who's been involved in how, you know, people see the NDP here provincially, which are just so in bed with labor. I mean, they're, they're I don't know if you've heard, but they're cutting down more old growth on Vancouver Island out near Port Renfrew, uh, it's Ferry Creek, it's called. And it's just shocking. It's because they, they're more in bed with the unions than they are with environmentalists. But then they pay lip service. Um, to, 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 to green causes, same with the feds. And so people don't look beyond that. And it's just so frustrating and, and realize that it takes a, a true green government to, to do what needs to be done. Um, yeah. You know. um, well, the problem is, is that uh, as long as we continue to think that profits and jobs are more important than the future exactly. survival of humanity, then that's the way it's gonna go. So, but I think that will come around. Uh, sometimes it seems that uh, the, the, the answers are impossible, but how do you solve an impossible problem? Well, you got to search for the uh, impossible solution. And uh, I think that can be achieved through the application of uh, imagination, courage, and passion. And uh, there's been so many cases throughout history where the impossible became possible. Slavery, women's right to vote. I mean, right. the very idea in 1972 that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa was unthinkable. And so it was impossible. And yet the impossible became possible. So I think that's what we focus on. Uh, what I, I, I think is the, the healthiest thing to do is you focus on what you can do in the present. Because what we do in the present will define what the future will be. We can't change the future. We can only uh, deal with the present. And that present will define what the future will be. Well, that's, yeah, that's good. Yeah, exactly. Because otherwise people just sort of throw up their hands. Oh, how can we ever fix it? Um, I know certainly I've been encouraged by, so BC has adopted the, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Persons, and we have a specific act that requires consultation. And, you know, people say, oh, it's going to slow down mining and forestry. I'm like, yeah, great. Now, now clearly some First Nations, you know, need those forestry and mining jobs. And so that that's a, a, a separate thing. But, you know, the, the federal government is seriously considering it. Because I keep thinking, you know, like when, are, when do we feel we're gonna be rich enough? Aren't we rich enough yet? You know, we need to be richer tomorrow. You know, when can, you know, can we fo fo focus on something more than profit? So well, the, anyways, law, uh, the yeah. law of finite resources dictates that there are finite resources. And, no, exactly. Uh, we can't just go on for, gone forever. As a problem with the British Columbia though, is uh, when it comes to indigenous rights, uh, BC by law belongs to the First Nations. That's the law. Uh, the problem is, is that uh, the present government is uh, violating the law. They're just ignoring the law. There was no treaty. It wasn't no. deeded over. It's their land. And uh, that it, if that's not recognized, and the people who don't recognize it are actually operating in a criminal manner. No, you're exactly right. Most of most of BC, you know, a little bit of Vancouver Island and the Northeast are, are treated, but well, you know, we've got some now, but no, you're completely right. 
Uh, okay, so more questions have come in. Uh, any anything you want to talk about with bycatch? Well, a good percentage of the um, uh, fish that uh, are taken from the sea, a good percentage of that is bycatch. Uh, for every kilo of shrimp, for example, 22 kilos of something else is thrown back dead. So uh, bycatch is a major, major problem uh, throughout the global fishing operations. And uh, again, it's not a problem amongst our artisanal and indigenous fishing operations. They use what they get, but it is a major problem with industrialized fishing operations. Uh, it's just inconvenient that they're catching these things which have no commercial value to them. So it's just tossed back. And is there any work afoot to, I don't know, uh, change gear standards, you know, the, 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 what, what, what the, how the fishing nets are constructed or to perhaps get a market for the bycatch? Well, there's a lot of talk, but the problem is, is that as long as money is going to be made, people are going to get around the sure. laws. Uh, right now, we're dealing uh, with trying to protect the endangered Paquita and the endangered Totoala fish in the Sea of Cortez from Mexico. And we're up against the cartels, the same cartels that, uh, that deal in drugs. The Totoava swim bladder on the Totoava fish is worth $20,000 a kilo. When you put that kind of price on it, well, that's a lot of motivation to break the law. So we're being attacked with Molotov cocktails. We're being shot at. Uh, you know, it's been very difficult to hold the line there to prevent the extinction of the Bikita uh, porpoise. But again, the problem is that I call it the economics of extinction. There's money to be made by driving species into extinction because scarcity translates into more demand, which translates into more profits. And right. uh, that's why, you know, fish becomes increasingly more and more expensive. I mean, the most expensive fish on the planet now is a bluefin tuna, the average price in Japan, $75,000 a fish. Um, you know, and, you know, Mitsubishi, for example, which has 10 to 15 year supply in their warehouses, they could stop fishing today and still supply their market for the next 10 years. But they won't do that because if they were to allow the bluefin tuna populations to recover in the wild, that will decrease the cost oh, of the commodity that they have in their warehouses. And say it goes extinct, then they have a priceless commodity and they can dictate the price. And they're not really concerned about the future of the fishery. It's all short-term oh, investment terrible. for short-term gain. And they'll just put that into something else, machinery or computers or whatever. Uh, that's the problem. Large fishing corporations don't really care about the future. They have no vested interest in protecting the fishery because it's just short-term profit uh, investment for short-term gain. Well, it does remind me, you know, I mean, we, we have a problem, obviously, with, with large-scale corporate logging in BC, but at least they, you know, you can see where they've logged and you can, and they at least have a legal requirement to reforest, you know, to the extent they might or might not do it well. But, you know, there, there, there's no similar thinking about, you know, a, 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 a section of the ocean that you have to sort of, you know, manage sustainably, right? It's just, it's, it's a rape and pillage. Well, with logging, what we do is we take a beautiful forest, which is a, uh, incredibly um, interdependent of so many various yeah. species and we just turn it into a tree farm which uh, in the long run isn't a healthy situation no 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 yeah I, I agree but but at least there's sort of you, you, you can see you you, you you can see where it was logged and say okay this has to be brought back to something you know whereas in in, in the ocean there's just no real ability yeah. to do to even the even do is, something like that at all in the ocean it's out of sight and out of mind yeah yeah part. Uh, d d have you seen now? Uh, uh, someone asked the question again. I'll, I guess I'll I didn't phrase it properly, but do you which level of governments do you think are the most susceptible positively to to pressure like ocean or to letter writing, etc.? Well, the only governments that I feel that are susceptible are the ones that are suffering because of their resources are being diminished by third parties like uh, the Asian and European fishing fleets, which are plundering the waters of Africa, right. or the uh, Chinese fleet, which is plundering the waters of the Eastern Tropical Pacific. That's when you get governments motivated, uh, when it's affecting them economically. Uh, so that's, other than that, there's not a lot of, a lot of motivation. No. Uh, any thoughts on the amount of medications being released in wastewater? Yeah, well, that's a major problem too. Antibiotics, others, everything that we put into our bodies, everything that we put down the sinks, everything goes into the toilets, ends up in the in marine uh, ecosystems. You know, for instance, a study in Norway showed that one of the major uh, sources of uh, microplastics just comes from automobile tires going down the road of tiny pieces which come off the tires, and that's a significant amount which ends up into the into marine ecosystems. Really, it's things that we just don't even think about that we're that we're putting into into the sea. 
but yes, uh, you know, the, the plastics and the uh, chemicals from uh, and, and, the, and the drugs that we put in our body do end up in uh, in the ecosystems. I think there's a very high level of antibiotic and drug uh, uh, residues uh, in um, in the Salish Sea area. Right. Well, I mean, it, it, clearly the lesson is uh, that that you know, uh, ge geoengineering or ocean engineering, you know, trying to fix it by dumping in, uh, uh, you know, iron filings or doing this and that is not, it's really, we just need to leave the ocean fallow, as okay. you said, those protected areas where you just don't touch it and let it recover on its own. And we have, we have the engineers. They're in, they've been in the ocean for millions of years. Everything yeah. from the phytoplankton, the zooplankton, the coral, all of those various species that they are the engineers of spaceship Earth. We got to leave them alone. That's the solution. Leave it alone, exactly. and it will recover. Yeah. You know, during the 20th century, the two periods when fish populations actually recovered somewhat, World War One, World War Two. Wars <laughs> have been good for marine ecosystems, uh, but uh, you know, we just have to leave. What is shown, what is demonstrated, is that we just leave it alone. Let it recover. Yeah. Let it repair the damage that we've done to it. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much, Paul. This has been absolutely wonderful and uh, wish you the best. And uh, well, I guess the closest you could get would be uh, San Juan Island or, or Seattle or something to us. So anyways. Well, all the best uh, uh, for your nomination on that. Thank you. you know, I go back with the Green Party a long time. I first ran for Parks Board way back in the 80s. I ran for, oh, okay, sure. I ran for member of Parliament Vancouver Center and for Vancouver Quadra. And I ran for mayor of Vancouver in 95 for the Green ah. Party. Brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, thank you so much. This is very much appreciated. But many, I haven't been reading all the thank yous and kudos, and uh, and uh, very much enjoyed. And we have uh, quite the good audience here today in terms of numbers. And so, and this will be recorded, and so others will be able to appreciate it later on. So, okay, thanks again. All the best. Thank you. It's been okay. a pleasure. Okay. Bye bye. Bye.